Amen. Hallelujah. You need to be somewhere. And uh, you know, these people that stay home and say, oh, I don't need to go to church. You know, you need to take a, a smart pill. Because uh, you can't just stay home. Amen. Praise God. If you have your Bibles, open up to the book of Exodus, please. Sometimes I wish God would just do this earlier. It would save me a lot of energy. But sometimes he does this. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I was sitting there and I was contemplating what I was going to do. and I felt the Lord wanted me to speak on this, what the church needs. What the church needs. You know, there's so many things today that the church provides to people, to families, to children, programs. But what is it that the church really, really needs? If we ask that question, because we are the church, of course, but if we ask that question, what is it that the church needs? And, and I believe that today we're living in a time. Are we on, by the way, Facebook? God bless you, those that are joining us by Facebook. I want to welcome you this morning. Um, I want to uh, apologize. We've been broadcasting our service with the worship service, but we didn't know that we couldn't do that because of some of the copyright on the songs that we sing. So uh, please forgive us for that. We cannot broadcast that. So now we're just broadcasting just the message. Uh, on, on, and that's important too, okay? Uh, so I just want to put that out there. And what the church needs sometimes is more than what we think we need. Sometimes we get into a place of complacency. Sometimes we get into a place of lull and dullness. Sometimes we get into a place where we're just satisfied with what we have. But I, I don't know about you, but this last week, I have not been satisfied of where I am or what I'm doing. I want more. I want more. And the more I, I, I want God in my life and in ministry, the more he shows me how empty in places I've been. Understand that it's not just coming to church on Sunday. If that's, your, if that's your relationship with God, then you know what? You need to really examine yourself and see if you're in the faith, like the Bible says. It's not about just coming once a week on Sunday morning. You know, when, uh, when that, I read that psalm to you, Psalm 122, I was glad when they said, let us go into the house of the Lord. Whenever the doors are open, you should be glad to come to the house of God. It shouldn't be a burden to you. It shouldn't be a, a sadness to you. It shouldn't be something heavy weighted on you like it's another chore or something that you have to do. And I want us to look at chapter 3 of Exodus this morning. If you have your Bibles, I hope you do. I'm going to start from reading from verse 1 this morning. One of my favorite, favorite people in the Bible is Moses. And it says, Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the back side of the desert. I want to give you a little bit of background here. Oh, I got to get my notes out. I might save that for a rainy day. I want to give you some background on this right here. This was Moses in Midian, but before that, you know what happened with Moses. He was in Egypt. God gave him a revelation. God gave him a promise. God gave him a mandate. God gave him a call. And he was called to deliver the children of Israel. He was to take the people of Israel from the place of bondage to a place of freedom, from a place of slavery to a place of sonship. He was to remove the, the heavy yoke that had been part of Israel's history for over 400 years. 
That was the call and that was the mandate. At the time, there was about two and a half million people that were under the Egyptian bondage. We all know in the typology that Egypt is a type of sin and, and Pharaoh was a type of Satan in, in typology. We understand that. But you know the story how Moses took it upon himself rather than waiting on God to show him or to bring him to that place of ministry. Remember he saw the Egyptian you know, fighting uh, with the Hebrew um, brother and he went and he killed the Egyptian and he hit him in the sand thinking that God was going to bring deliverance through violence. You know the story. Moses had to flee. And because he didn't wait upon God, because he didn't seek God, because he wasn't in the right place with God, God had to put him on probation. He was 40 years on the backside of the desert. 40 is the number of probation. And so he was put aside. God put him aside for 40 years. Think about that. Moses wasn't used by God until he was 80 years old. So there's still hope for me. And in this place, in the backside of the desert, I want you to know this is a very emotional thing for me because I've been there. I know what it's like to feel that people have deserted you. People have left you. Those that have said to your face, you, they were your friends and they love you, and they stabbed you in the back. I've been there. I've been there when I, I sensed like, God, where are you? Even though theologically I know and doctrinally I know he's always there. There have been times of loneliness. There have been times of great discouragement. There's times of wondering, will that vision of, will that ministry ever come to fruition? A fruition, as Debbie will correct me. Like Moses on the backside of this desert, shepherding sheep. I mean, there's not too much to do. You know, you have a, you have a dog that runs around and collects them all, and they just sit around and eat and get fat all day. Isn't that true about the church? Sometimes the church, the sheep just sit around and get fat all day. They don't exercise. They don't go out. They don't, they don't evangelize. They don't talk about Jesus. They don't do anything. And here Moses is in this place. And, I, and he had plenty of time because understand there was no Xbox. There was no PlayStation. There was no cable. There was no Internet. There were very few books. So he had plenty of time to think. And you can understand that when you're in the realm of thinking or processing, that the enemy of your soul, Satan himself, is right there to, to combat you with all kinds of thoughts and negativity and, and to try to silence the very things that God has called you. And here's Moses on the back side of the desert, and he's, <clears throat> he's sitting there. Oh, I got something. He's sitting there, and he's just contemplating and thinking, is this ever going to come to pass? Forty years has gone by. When God said that he would be the deliverer of his people, sometimes we can't even wait a week for God to move. Sometimes we can't, can't even wait a year or two five years or ten years or twenty years and we think that God has forsaken us. You can think of all these emotions and all these feelings that Moses was going through. He was a man on the backside of a desert. He wasn't even tending his own flock. He was tending his father-in-law's flock. It says, and he came to the mountain of God, to Horeb. I want you to understand the providence of God. 
that even when you wander, even when you're out there and you don't think that he's in control, he is. When you think that all hope is lost, when you think that there's no other way to turn and you're, you're almost stuck like in a 22 position. You're, you know, you, you, don't, you can't go left, you can't go right, you can't go forward, you can't go back. But even in the midst of that wandering, somehow Moses finds his place at the mountain of God. God will always bring you back to himself. God will always place you right where he is at in your time of need. And in verse 2 it says, And the angel, messenger of God. Some believe that this is the, the epiphany of Jesus Christ before his incarnation. This was an appearing, like he appeared in the furnace with Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. Out of the midst of the bush, God had to take something that was visible in the natural to speak to Moses something that which was spiritual. Burning bush. And he beheld, he beheld the bush, but the bush was burning with fire and the bush was not consumed. Think about it. See a fire going on, you know that that thing is going to be consumed. But for some reason, that bush didn't catch fire in a sense where it was consumed, but it caught fire. So there was a supernatural manifestation on something that was natural. Can I tell you that's what God wants to do and what the church needs today? Hallelujah. It's not just a, a, a physical manifestation, but a spiritual manifestation of God. Not something that just goes through the motions. Not just going through to go to church not just wanting the things of God in theory only, but having a heart that says, I want you, God, I want all of you, more of you, God, I want the things of you, God, I want to be filled with your spirit, I want the gifts of the spirit, God, I need everything that you've got for me because it's a rough road down here. Hallelujah, I don't know about you, but we want things easy. We, what the church needs is have everything that God has provided for you. He says that God has given us all things that pertaineth unto life and godliness, but it's not just forced upon you. You've got to receive it. You've got to be open for it. You've got to be like an antenna. You've got to be able to receive the signal from God and receive it into your house. Hallelujah. It's up to you. And here Moses was at this manifestation, if you will, of this strange fire. Can I tell you, in the natural, sometimes the things of God look strange. When we try to discern how God moves and what he does, sometimes in the natural it doesn't make any sense. In the next verse, Something dramatic happens. Moses said, I will now turn aside. You see the providence of God. You see the hand of God leading Moses, even when he didn't realize he was being led, to the spot where God puts a desire in his heart to turn aside. Hallelujah. You're not here today by mistake. You're here because God brought you here today. Hallelujah. The Bible says the steps of a good man or woman are ordered by God. 
Hallelujah. And yes, it may have been tough, and yes, you may have had to have some struggles to get here. And I, I can tell you this, from the beginning of our ministry, people have always said, it's a struggle to get here. Why? Why is it such a struggle? Because anything worth its salt is worth its money. Hallelujah. Moses said, I will now turn aside, and I will see this great sight. Why? The bush was not burned. Moses wasn't so interested at the moment in the spiritual aspect of it. He was interested in the natural aspect of it, of why something that was made of wood that was on fire was not burned. God will use something in the natural to get your attention to bring you to a spiritual conclusion. Hallelujah. And in verse 4, he said this. And when the Lord saw, we know God sees everything. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, there was a divine appointment waiting for him, but a lot of times we miss it because we won't turn aside. You know, they say curiosity kills a cat. It's good to be curious. It's good to wonder, God, what are you going to do this Sunday? God, what are you going to do in me this Sunday? I'm looking forward to giving my little 40-cent tithe. I'm looking forward, God, to give it to you. Look, oh, we can learn so many, so many lessons from a little child. How God loves a cheerful giver. And when the Lord saw that he had turned aside, God called. You will not hear God's voice unless you respond to God's invitation. You will not hear God's voice unless you respond to his invitation. God called out to him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. Can you imagine? I believe, I believe that as he was in that desert for 40 years, he didn't hear the voice of God at all. He was on probation. You say, well, how do you know that? Well, between the Old Testament and New Testament, it was known as the silent period when God didn't say anything for 400 years. I believe he was on the backside of this desert. He was tending sheep and he was asking God, you know, or, or talking to God, and God was not talking back to him. Because God had to have that point in time. He had to have that divine appointment where he would lead him to a place. And in that place, that's where God wanted to speak to him. If you want God to speak to you, you've got to get out from where you are to where God is. Hallelujah. And he said, can you imagine this? Can you imagine hearing God? Speak your name. Can you imagine that? All of a sudden you're home. And you hear, Edith. Edith. You probably get her gun out and look for somebody. But can you imagine that? Hearing the audible voice of God. Calling your name. Joseph. You're in bed. You're laying there. Joseph. Joseph. And he answered him. He said, I am here. Here I am. Right here. God was bringing a revelation to Moses of who he was. It is here that God began to speak to Moses. 
and explain to him what his purpose was. Can I tell you what the church needs is to get back to the Bible? What the church needs is not all the gimmicks and all the controls and all of the uh, flashiness and all of that stuff. What we need to do is get back to the Bible and get back to believing and get back to faith and get back to believing God to do the impossible. Get back with God in relationship and have a close relationship, a walk with God that can be seen in each individual's life. That's what the church needs. It's not about just coming together and shouting hallelujah on Sunday morning. That's religion. I had that way back years ago. Just went to church, sat down, said a few things, kneeled down, stood up, sat down again, kneeled back down, got up. That's all I did. And I went in the same and came out the same. I don't want that. And I, I, don't, I see the church is doing that now. Not just our church, but churches everywhere. People are just going in and coming out and going in and coming out and going in and coming out and going in and coming out. And nothing is getting resolved and nothing is happening in their life. Something's missing. And I believe what's missing is the fire of the Holy Ghost. He said, when I go away, it's expedient for you. When I go away, Jesus said, it's expedient for you. He said, when I go away, it's expedient for you. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come. But when I go, I will send him to you, and he shall come. Hallelujah. I don't care if you believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit or you don't believe it. It makes no difference to me. But I want to tell you that the Bible believes it. Hallelujah. That God believes it. Hallelujah. He said, you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. With fire. Hallelujah. With the revelation of who he is, fire. What is your compassion? What is your compassion? You get all excited about the things in the world, of doing things in the world, but what about the church? What about Christ? What about serving him? Where's your fire for him? I remember Linda when she first got saved. She had a fire for snow skiing. She'd miss church on Sunday during the winter so she could go skiing. Then she got tied up with this Holy Ghost man. When I got together with Linda the first time I, I, I met with her, she would give a tithe, she gave $2. I said, you make $20 a week? She said, no. She, a little bit of the Catholicism just kind of slapped over on the, on the new person, you know. I said, did you ever hear of tithing? She said, yeah. I said, you know what it means? She said, no. I said, it means giving God a tenth of all that you increase, of your increase. She says, oh, I didn't know that. Before you know it, God started to deal with her. She started to say, you know what? I can't go on the weekend skiing anymore because God's dealing with me. I said, good. Good that he deals with you before we get married. She hung up her ski. Listen, I'm, I want you to understand this. Linda loved, say love, skiing. Every weekend she could, when it was snow up there, she would go skiing. When she became a Christian, when she dedicated her life to Christ, she hung up her skis and walked away. See, when Linda and I, we, we teach you these things, it's not because we have not done these things. I walked away from a career in music. I refused to continue playing in the nightclubs when I became a Christian. I hung that up when I, when I started to follow Jesus. So what we're telling you is not something theoretic, theoretically. We're ta talking to you experientially what we have done.
you cannot keep the world and your Jesus doesn't work. What is your desire? What is the thing you get enthusiastic about? What is the thing you devote your time to? Is it Christ? Is it to eternity? Is it to the things of the kingdom of God? Or is it to the things of yourself and your kingdom? Then you wonder why everything's not working out. You wonder why everything's all messed up. God called to him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, he said, here am I. Will you answer his call if he came? Would you be able to be on speaking terms with God if he came to you and, and verbally spoke to you? You know, the Apostle Paul said this. He said, you know, when he went and he preached the word of God, it says that, he said, I want to thank you that you received the words that I spoke to you as they were the very words of God. Did you know that? Do you know that you can hear God speak to you through the message this morning? If you put me aside and hear what the Spirit of God has to say to you today. See, we still fondle things. We still, we still, we live in a, in a church age that is so dangerous. It is so dangerous because there, have, there has been such a mixture of, of the world and the philosophy of the world and the ideology of the world, where actually, I want to say that they're demon-inspired to undermine faith, to undermine the things of God, to undermine the gifts of the Spirit, to undermine the things that God has provided for His church. And the devil comes and says, you don't need those things. You don't need to be committed anymore. You don't, you're too, don't get too fanatical. I want to be fanatical. I want to be so sold out that people say, like they said to the Apostle Paul, you've gone mad with all of your studying. I want Jesus so much to live in me that people see not just what I do, but they see Christ in me. Not some snowflake Jesus that's out there in many churches today. You have snowflake Jesus. Jesus is just this big marshmallow full of love. And there's no holiness, no righteousness, no commitment. Just this big Jesus. That's a fake Jesus. Yes, God is love, but he's a lot more than that. You can't separate God's love from His holiness. You can't separate God's love from His righteousness. You cannot separate His love from His indignation. He said, here I am. In verse 5, God says something very particular to Moses. God now tells Moses, don't draw near me. Moses had the idea that he could approach God just the way he was. Sometimes we get complacent. And we think, well, we're under grace, you know, we can just go before God just the way I am. No, you can't. No, you can't. This protocol. If we go before God, we must first go with our clean hands and a pure heart. Remember, you're going before a holy God, not just God. A holy God. See, the church has taken God and brought him down to such a human level that we just treat him like a, a buddy, you know, like he's just one of us. And he's far more superior, far more holy, far more reverent. 
We need to reverence him and honor him. He told Moses, he says, put off your shoes off your feet. I don't see Moses arguing with God. Well, God, if you want me, you take me just the way I am. Shoes and all, because, Lord, my feet are sweaty and smelly. I'm not taking my shoes off. I don't have to do anything to get God's favor. I don't have to do anything to get near God. I don't have to take my shoes off. What kind of attitude is that? But an attitude of pride. He said, take off your shoes. It's, it's, it's not within our culture to think this way. Taking off your shoes is a sign of respect. Did you know that? Jewish culture, when you walk into somebody's home, you take off your shoes. It's a sign of respect. In other words, Wherever you walked before is not worthy to be in the presence of God. And he gives them the reason. He just doesn't tell them to do something without giving them the reason. He said, for the place whereupon you stand is holy ground. When you come into the church, this sanctuary, the Bible says, bless the Lord in the sanctuary. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary. Nope, not me. I'm not doing that. And you wonder why things aren't working out. You won't obey. But if you want the things that God has for you, obey. He said, take it off. Put off your shoes. The place where you're standing is holy ground. Can I tell you, this building, this particular uh, space in this building is dedicated as the sanctuary of the Lord. It's the place called the tabernacle. It's a place called church. But it's more than that. It's the place where we gather together and we allow the Holy Spirit. We sang it this morning. Welcome, Holy Spirit. Listen to me. Holy Spirit. Holy. Well, I didn't feel nothing today, Pastor. Well, maybe there's something wrong with your antenna. Maybe it's time to do away with the antenna. Get hooked up to cable. You have a direct connection. Get more channels. He said, for the place that you're standing, Moses, is holy ground. What the church needs is to get out of this mentality of the seeker-friendly, trying to make people happy, trying to get people, you know, to come to church. You say, but pastor, don't we should have sinners in this congregation? Read Psalm 1. Read Psalm 1. When I talk about sinners, I'm not talking about sinless people. I'm talking about those who are still in the old nature that have not been converted, that are not Christian. They, why should they be in the congregation of the Lord? What purpose is that for them? They're not going to go to heaven. Read it. Can, can we just read that for a minute? Psalm 1. Put that up your phone, Pastor, will you? Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in its season. His leaves shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Say it with me. The ungodly are not so. But like the chaff the which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in judgment, 
nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. Hello. It's not about seeker-friendly. It's about getting people saved and transformed by the power of God. Hallelujah. Now, I'm not saying that a sinner can't come in and get saved. What I'm saying is they can't stay that way and think they're saved. And so the church adapts its theology, adapts its preaching, adapts everything to the sinner. Well, you know, we don't want to offend anybody because if we offend somebody, they're going to leave and they won't come back. Not that we are intentionally trying to offend anyone. We're not. But let's not, let's not preach repentance now because, you know, that will offend people. Let's not preach about the cross anymore. Let's take the cross down. Let's, let, let's, let's make it more, uh, more friendly, inviting. We, you know, we'll paint all the walls black, ceiling black. We'll, we'll, you know, we'll make it more like identification so they can identify. We'll make it like a nightclub. We'll put the pink lights, the blue lights, the white lights, the flashing lights and all that. We'll make it more uh, sinner friendly. They wouldn't hear the voice of God in that kind of a place. Since when did Jesus conform his message so that he could have a big crowd? In fact, the real truth is when he preached his last message and he went into the garden, all forsook him. And I'm going to tell you right now, when tribulation comes and persecution comes to the church, you're going to see who really follows Jesus, who really is saved. I tell those people all the time, watch your Social Security because if they tell you, if you don't renounce your Christianity, they're taking your Social Security check away. What are you going to do then? We're going, to put, we're going to put a freeze on your assets so you can't get no money out of the bank unless you renounce it. It's coming. It is coming. Either it's coming or the Bible's a lie. I believe the Bible's true and I believe it's coming. What are you going to have in your reservoir? What are you going to have in your lamp? What are you going to tell Jesus when you stand before him and he says, what have you done with for me? What have you done for me? How many souls have you won? How many people did you pray for? How many people did you invite into my presence? Verse 6. God will continue speaking when you continue obeying. Take off your shoes. Take off your shoes. Not literally, I'm not talking about take your shoes off. But when you obey whatever God says to do, He'll further speak to you. These snowflake Christians today that tell me. Some of them have been in the ministry 60 years. How can somebody be in a ministry 60 years and say, listen, this is a manifestation of God, gold falling, gold dust falling from the ceiling? That's God. <clears throat> That's a manifestation of God. How can anybody in their right mind believe that? Because everybody's looking for something other than God. Everybody wants something other than God. People want to be entertained. If you live in an entertainment society, you turn the TV on, you're entertained. You go to a movie, you're entertained. You do an activity, you're entertained. We are in an entertainment mode in this world. God's not here to entertain you. God, he God is here. To equip you. God is here to call you for a purpose. Think about it. You say, but I'm old. Mm, not really. 
Moses was 80 when he began his. Here God speaks to Moses again. He says, I am the God of thy father. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. What are you saying here? I am the God of covenant agreement and promise. And Moses' response was, oh, come on, Jesus, come and sit on my bed and talk with me. Come on, Jesus, sit on my couch. Come on, Jesus, sit down and, and rap with me. Is that what happened? What does it say? Moses hid his face. You know what that means? It's more than just covering your face, I agree. It's symbolic. Moses was hiding his identity from God if he could. When you see a face, you, you, you identify. And symbolically, he's hiding his identity from God because he's ashamed of who, what he had, had become what he had done. He was afraid to look upon God. Why? God is God's light. I mean, Paul the Apostle, when he had the light of God shine upon him, have God speak to you, speak your name. Why was he afraid to look upon God? Because he needed to get his heart right. When you need to get your heart right, you're afraid of God. You don't have to be afraid of God because he gives you the invitation to come to him. But you must come under his direction. You must come under his instruction. In the book of Hebrews it says, that we may come boldly or with confidence before the throne of grace, to obtain what? Grace first and mercy in time of need. The grace is to get right with God. Forsake sin, turn from sin, confess your sin, apply God's grace to your life, and walk in that mercy that he gives you. Now you can go into his presence. There's protocol. Just don't jump in the presence of God. There's protocol. Verse 7. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people. First, God gets personal with Moses. First, God talks to Moses. So many people try to answer the call first without first talking with God. So many people try to fulfill the promise of God in their life without personal relationship with God. It doesn't work, trust me. You cannot be who you are in God and not be committed. How do you know a person's committed? By the outward actions. How do you know that, Pastor? Well, the Bible says, by their fruits you shall know them. Oh, I, I don't go to church on Sunday because I, I, that, in the summertime, because that's when we go to the amusement parks every Sunday. Oh, we have baseball games on Sunday. Can't, can't, can't go to church. Well, I got to work. I got to work on Sunday. No, I got to work. Can't, can't come to Bible study. Just can't. Can't come to Bible. Can't come to prayer. Oh, no, prayer. prayer. It's just prayer anyway. I'll show you a committed Christian. As I said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. I remember, Debbie remembers these days. Remember when we were with Brother Norman and 
and the services we had. We had we had a Monday night youth, and then we had a Thursday night Bible study, and then we had Saturday night service, and then we would go somewhere Sunday morning. Some of us in Sunday night, some of us. We were in church all the time. We were with God's people all the time. There was such a hunger to be in God's presence. There was such a hunger to be with God's family. And we would go, and sometimes we would go to Lums, and we'd sit there after service. We'd, we'd go there like five, six hours of the service. Five hours, I'd say. Then after service, some of us would go to Lums Restaurant, and we'd stay there till 1, 2 o'clock in the morning. Then we'd leave there, go to Dunkin' Donuts, and stay there till 5, 6 o'clock in the morning. And we would talk about golf, skiing, bowling, roller skating, having fun. No, we talk about the Lord. We talk about the Lord all the time. It was something that was deep inside of our hearts. And my question is, where has that gone? Where is that enthusiasm? Where is that tenacity? Where is that hunger for those things? That is what the church needs. It's not all this other fluff and stuff and programs. I've seen teenagers. Today they're not interested in church. Today they're interested in playing, having fun, running around. But can I tell you, I've seen the youth group At the church I belong to, young teenagers, junior high, high school, come together, get on their knees, begin to pray, and bring their classmates to church, and they get saved, and they pray for them, lay hands on them. They get filled with the Holy Spirit, with the evidence of speaking in tongues. Where are those days? The church has evolved in itself. It has become worldly, carnal, fleshly, and the desires of the church are no longer a concern. It's me, myself, and I. Let me ask you this question this morning. As you look to the left and to the right of you, you see empty chairs. Does that bother you? that bother you? Come on, somebody shake your hand if that bothers you. Does it bother you enough to go out and tell somebody about Jesus? I've got too much to do, Pastor. I'm, I'm too busy. I don't have enough time. No, you have enough time. You need to spend it. And this is not a plug for evangelism. This is a plug for being a Christian. This is what you should do. You should be happy to be a Christian. I'm kind of making a joke of it because, but that's what it's really all about. Where's the enthusiasm? I'm telling you, when we used to go to Saturday night service and it was just really a praise and worship time and then a little bit of the word and then we'd pray for people. We'd start at 7, wouldn't get out till 11.30. We'd have a two-hour song service. Man, we have a 45-minute here. I see people going... Come on. People would love to praise the Lord. People love to be in church. They came, and I'm telling you, listen, we had over 200 people. We used to stuff that church full. Remember? Used to be filled all the way to the back. People standing sometimes. It'd be so hot in there, I remember. We'd sweat. I used to be on the piano, and Brother Norman would be on the organ, or vice versa. Two-hour song service, praising the Lord, jumping and shouting, bucking and kicking. What happened to the church? It became sophisticated. It became dominated 
by complacency. That's not the church. The church is alive. Hallelujah. But the church will only be alive as you are alive in God. Now the Lord speaks to Moses. And he says this. I have surely seen the affliction of my people. The fulfillment of ministry will not be done until God speaks to me personally. Until you have that revelation of a burning bush, until you have that burning bush experience, until you're filled with the Spirit of God, until you're on fire for God, your purpose, your plan, your destiny will never be fulfilled until you get into the closet with until I get in the closet with God, until we seek after God and say, God, what's my purpose? My purpose isn't just working for men. If that's your supplemental purpose, you need to see the light of it. What is the purpose of, of my being? To make money? Oh, well and good, you need to go to school, you need to learn, you need to do all the things. That's not the issue. The issue is, what are you going to do about Jesus Christ? What are you going to do about Jesus Christ? Because one day, either now or later, you will be confronted with that question. What did you do about Jesus Christ? Either now, surrendering, being committed, being born again, or when you stand at the white throne judgment, God, and God says to you, what did you do about Jesus? It's going to happen either or, either place. Either you're going to do it down here, or you're going to go up there, you're going to give an account for it, and then you can wait up there. He says, I have surely seen the afflictions of my people which are in Egypt, and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. Listen, even though those people were ill-treated, they, they were had hearts filled with sorrow, God still waited on Moses. Can I tell you right now, there are people that God has placed in your life, okay, that are in sorrow. They're in turmoil. They're under the taskmaster, Satan, and his bidding. And God is saying, I've seen their sorrow. I've seen, I've heard their cry. And this is what he's saying to you and I personally. Do I have time? He says, I've come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptian king, to bring them out of that land unto a good land, a lodge unto a land flowing with milk and honey, unto the place of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hittites, and Jebusites. What is he saying there? How did God deliver them? How did God deliver the Israelites? Through Moses. If you're expecting your family to get saved, they need to see something on fire in you. They need to see that personal commitment that you have, not just on Sunday. They need to see that you're no longer like the world because the world has nothing in you. You don't do what the world does. Believe it or not, I, I've heard of some Christians still smoking marijuana. There's some Christians still go out and party, drink, get drunk. What has fellowship with light with darkness? How, how, how does that come? How do, you, how do you equate that? How do you bring that in? We're supposed to be different. Hallelujah. I haven't had a drink of alcohol in over 35 years. I haven't smoked a marijuana cigarette in over 35 years. I haven't taken drugs in over 35 years. Why? Because I don't need it. I used to need it. 
But I found something that's greater than marijuana. I found someone who's greater than alcohol. I found someone greater than all the pills. I found something greater than sleeping around. Hallelujah. I found Jesus Christ. You want your family saved? God says, go out and get them. Bring them in. Go ye into all the world, preach the gospel. You say, but pastor, I'm not a preacher. God says, yes, you are. You're a preacher of your testimony. You may not be a preacher, know how to put sermons together, know how to speak in public places, but you can speak. And don't tell me you don't know how to speak because some of you go on that phone three, four hours a day. Talk up a storm on the phone. Come on. You can talk up on, the, on the phone. You, you can talk to your colleagues. You can talk to people at work or at the laundromat. You can talk to anybody. Tell them what Jesus means to you. Tell them what it means to be saved. Tell them why. Because it's warning time. What the church needs is a prophet. A voice. Go to the next verse for a moment. Go to the next one. Here it is. This is the one. Come now, therefore, on what I just spoke to you. And I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Do not compromise the gospel. Do not compromise the message. Do not compromise your convictions solely so that you can be acceptable in society. Do not compromise when confronted with false doctrine. Do not compromise when people come inexperienced in theological matters and think they know everything when they know nothing. How many times do you have religious people come to you and tell you that you're wrong, you don't know what you're talking about? You talk about Jesus. I had a woman one time when I was trying to tell her about Jesus, she got all mad. Don't you tell me why I know all about Jesus. Hair all wrinkled, you know, eyes all wrinkled, man, fire coming out of her ears. I know Jesus. I know Jesus. You don't know Jesus. You know a Jesus, but you don't know the Jesus. So many people know a Jesus, but they don't know the Jesus. Because this Jesus says it all. If you want to be the church, if you want the church to be what you want it to be, then you must go where Jesus tells you to go and send you out to preach the gospel. That's the only way this church is going to grow. Jesus says, go out to the highways the byways and suggest that they come in. Is that what he said? Would you like to come to church? Please, please come to church with me. Please. No. He says, compel them. Compel them. You want to see something going on? You want change in your life? You want to see God to do miracles in your life? Come with me to church. Compel. Not, please come to church. Please come to church. Come to my church, please. Compel them. If that's not true for you, get some white out. White it out of your Bible. If that scripture's not for you, white it out of your Bible. If you don't believe that, white it, wipe, wipe it out of your Bible. Jesus is speaking to everyone. Compel them to come in. 
tell them, repent or perish. Oh, I don't believe that, Pastor. Write it out of your Bible. Before you know it, you'll only have a Bible this thick. Compel them to come in. Well, that's not my personality. Well, it should be. You're a new creation in Christ Jesus. Old things have passed away. Get rid of your old personality. Some people's personalities have been transformed by the devil, by living in the world and in sin all of their life. And they think that's the real them. That's not the real you. The real you is the one that God knows who is you, that he created to be a new cre creation. All things are passed away. All things, all things become new. Did you know that your pastor used to be shy growing up? My dad used to offer me money to sing in front of people. I'd run and hide in my bedroom. Did you know that? Did you know that I couldn't, I couldn't stand before people and speak? I used to run and hide. And it was only until I started drinking alcohol that I got the courage to go before people to play in a nightclub. Without that, I couldn't do it. I'd have to have two or three drinks in me. But see, that formed my personality. And I didn't go to God at, when he called me and say, well, God, I can't, like Moses, God, I, 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 can't, I can't speak. I, 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 I stutter. You know, I, I, my personality. I didn't tell God, well, that's my personality. I'm shy. I can't get up in front. I can't be a pastor. I can't be behind a pulpit. become a new creation. When I am weak, then I'm strong. I can't, but he can. Hear me now. This is what the church needs. They get back on fire. Get back on fire. Get back on fire. He said, you will be baptized with the Holy Ghost and fire. Hallelujah. You need fire. I need fire. We want the fire. Not strange fire. Not gold dust and feathers. The real fire. Not some fake tunnel fire where they got a cloth, a silk satin cloth, and it's 30 feet, 40 feet, 50 feet long. And they stand there and wave it like this, and people come running down the aisle, and they get, quote, supposedly the fire of God. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the fire of God to motivate you for your purpose, for your call, for your relationship with God. Let me ask you this question. Play something. Are you going to turn aside? Are you going to turn aside? Or are you going to turn away? Are you going to walk out these doors this morning and take this sermon and just throw it aside? Not for me. Or are you going to turn aside? Are you going to cry out and say, God, I don't need no gimmicks. I don't need no, no entertainment. I need you. I need your fire. I need the Holy Ghost. Oh, the church has lived so long without the Holy Ghost. He's backed away because of our sinfulness. He's backed away because of our unrighteousness. He's backed away because of our compromise with the world. The Holy Ghost wants to move back into the church. The Holy Ghost wants to move back into your life. The Holy Spirit wants to speak to you. He wants to fellowship with you and with me. Will you turn away? Or will you turn aside? 
so many hurts. We talked about it earlier. And Moses had so many hurts, so many disappointments, banished, if you will, a convicted murderer on the backside of the desert. Forty years. Most likely thinking that his trial was over. Likely saying, My daughter was left to me like this. God has given you your manifestation of your burning bush this morning. You say, Pastor, my fire has been burned, the flame. Still there, but it's flickering. Almost ready to go out. And I tell you, that's because your lamp is low on oil. Oil is symbolic of the Holy Spirit. You say, I need the oil. I need more oil. I need all that God has for me. I will not settle. listen to me, only those who really, really have this need to turn aside and see this phenomenon. I want you to come up here. I want you to come this morning. Will you turn aside or will you turn away? Today, Aside, see, or turn us away and dismiss what God is saying to the church. Today is the day that you stop. Today is the day you begin a deeper, closer walk. Today is the day. It's not just coming, but today is the day of new beginnings, of a greater hunger your heart and your life for the things of God and for the kingdom of God. God's kingdom first. God's kingdom